Hello and good evening and welcome to Wildlife from the Wildlife Trust for April 2022. You know, so often we hear the phrase that we're living in a climate and ecological emergency. But in my experience, very often what the environmental movement has been guilty of is talking about these issues as, as if they're quite separate. To talk about climate change in a box over here and talk about nature in another box over here. To my great frustration, there hasn't been nearly enough conversations over the last few years about the interaction between climate change and nature. So tonight, the big thing that we're going to look at tonight is very much, can nature adapt to a changing climate? There's lots of different aspects of the debate around climate and nature that we could focus on. But what we particularly wanted to do, because it's, it's overlooked and we don't spend enough time talking about it, is ask that question, can nature adapt to a changing climate, the climate change that we already know is locked in and is going to happen. How will nature fare as a result of it? And what can we do about it to perhaps help nature adapt better? And we've got a fantastic panel to help us explore that question and issues around this. I'm delighted to say that tonight we have Professor Sir John Lawton, British ecologist and conservationist. Catherine Brown, Director of Climate Change and Evidence at the Wildlife Trusts and John Rose, Senior Land Management Officer at Staffordshire Wildlife Trust. Also, Rosie Holdsworth, Countryside and Partnerships Manager at the National Trust. So Sir John, Catherine, John and Rosie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And I'll give a bit more of an introduction to each of you in turn as we go through the panel right at the start. Of course, though, the big issue about wildlife is you can interact with us. You can tell us what you're thinking. You can ask questions of the panel. We get an awful lot through and we can never get through anything like all of them, but we will try our best to get as many questions as possible from you to the panel tonight. So do make sure you put those questions in the YouTube chat uh, if you're watching live and we will try our best to get them to this amazing panel to really explore these issues. And it's going to be quite the topic. So we're going to kick off uh, with uh, hearing from Catherine Brown, who, as I said, is Director of Climate Change and Evidence at the Wildlife Trust. She has worked for the past 20 years in a range of policy and evidence roles on climate change and was previously head of adaptation at the Climate Change Committee, where she directed the production of the UK Independent Assessment of Climate Risk and the Climate Change Committee's analysis of progress in adapting to climate change in England. Prior to 2012, she worked for 10 years in DEFRA on a range of issues and roles on adaptation and mitigation on climate, and as a lead negotiator for the EU in some of the UN climate negotiations. And she was awarded an OBE for services to climate change research in 2022. So it's going to be fascinating to hear from Catherine tonight. Before we go to Catherine, Let's hear a quick summary from her about the risks that climate change poses to the natural environment from last year's UK climate change risk assessment. I'm standing in the forest at Swinley Park in Berkshire, and it's another example of one of the locations we're looking at that will face its own set of challenges from the changing climate. The hazards that are being faced here and that will be faced in the future are very similar to other parts of the UK increased heat, flooding, water scarcity and wildfire. But the way those hazards will manifest themselves will be different in different locations. Almost exactly 10 years ago, a huge wildfire ripped through the forest near here. It was the largest incident ever attended by the Berkshire Fire and Rescue Service. And subsequently, over 50,000 trees were replanted to help to repair the damage. Landscapes like this can take decades to recover from the effects of wildfire. And sometimes that damage can be irreversible. Looking around us at the natural environment, it's easy to see why it's so sensitive to the changing climate. We've got sensitive habitats like the beech woodland behind me and sensitive species as well. A lot of this area is protected for ground nesting birds such as woodlarks and night jars that migrate here from places across Africa. There's also a cuckoo singing behind me that you might be able to hear and that's another declining species that's very sensitive to the changing climate. But it's not just the natural environment that is at risk in this location. It's a really good example of how all of the risks we look at in the risk assessment interact across sectors. We've got major pipelines running through this area. There's major road and rail links connecting London with the southwest of England and Wales. And there's hospitals, homes, schools and care homes around the perimeter of the forest as well. This area we're standing in is run for commercial forestry by the Crown Estate. 
there is adaptation happening here. There's mixed planting, there's fire breaks to try to reduce the risk from wildfire. And more widely, Bracknell Forest Council's draft local plan has a whole chapter on climate change adaptation and mitigation, looking at how to improve the resilience of infrastructure in the built environment in the future. Adaptation is happening, but the risk assessment shows at the national level that the gap between the level of adaptation and the level of risk is increasing over time. So Catherine, it is fascinating, isn't it? I think for many of people that have worked on nature over the years, we've sort of seen climate change as a obviously something to worry about, but perhaps have seen other impacts, other issues that might be seen as a, a greater impact on nature in the short term. But essentially long term, medium to long term, it's now thought that climate change represents one of the greatest threats to nature. Can, you know, maybe can you set out the latest evidence for us on that? Yeah, of course. And, and the, the fact we're doing this event tonight as well is really timely and, and not by accident because we've just seen uh, the third of a series of reports coming out on the global assessment of climate change from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. And what those reports have really showed, I mean, some of the messaging is actually quite harrowing, um, that we're not thinking about this as a long-term issue anymore. It's very much a here and now issue. Um, and the report's been incredibly uh, blunt and firm about the impacts we're seeing from climate change to nature globally. So we've had over a degree of uh, warming since pre-industrial levels already. And what the report is saying is that that is having impacts everywhere across the globe. And that uh, on the basis of current policy implementation, we're looking at a three degree rise in global temperature by the end of the century, which will have catastrophic impacts on, on nature and people across the world. And what we're really looking at and what we were talking about in, in that little video from the UK climate change risk assessment that the climate change committee published last year is trying to understand, you know, what, what can we do? What can people do? What can organizations like ours do to help nature adapt as best it can, certainly to the climate change we've already experienced and are seeing now, but also thinking about this longer term picture, potentially with very high levels of global warming. And what can we possibly do to, to, to try and help that, that transition that, that is already inevitable and maybe that's coming in the future. And that's really obviously what we want to get into talking about tonight as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, and say a little bit more, if you had to really summarise it, what, what can we do about it? I mean, obviously, people will be very familiar with <clears throat> all the stories about the need to stop burning fossil fuels and all those things in terms of the mitigation side of it. But I mean, if you had to summarise it down to some key key points, what, what could we do to help nature adapt? I mean, we'll be talking a lot more about this tonight, but what for you are the big headlines? Yeah, and, and that's exactly it. So one of the things we absolutely have to do in the UK and globally is reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as fast as we possibly can, as quickly as we possibly can. And the other really um, a disturbing, really, and challenging message that the IPCC report was coming out with was to say the greenhouse gas emissions in 2019 were the highest in human history. So despite the fact that the world has known this is coming, that we've been acting for over 40 years to try and reduce the impacts of climate change, you know, climate change is still escalating. First and foremost, the, the best adaptation in a way is actually reducing our greenhouse gas emissions globally, mitigation. But really tonight, we'd, we'd really want to focus on those adaptation actions. So what that means is things that we can do to reduce the actual impacts of climate change as they're happening. So preparing for, for the changes that we're already experiencing and going to experience in the future. Now, so John will come on to this because, um, and, and so will John and Rosie and actually the practical things we're doing and so John's framework that, that's over 10 years old now really gives us a kind of a Bible really of adaptation for the natural environment, which is um, about reducing other pressures on, on nature. So trying to make sure that we're protecting areas as much as possible, that we're restoring and recovering areas for nature so that, so that species have space to move into as the climate is changing, reducing other pressures like pollution, and everybody, every action can actually make a difference. So no matter how small, if you've got a garden, if you've got a window box, all these actions can actually make a difference to reducing the risk from climate change. So one of the questions we had in advance, Catherine, was for Mike Spencer, says, is there any chance that the UK will actually gain more species than it loses as a result of climate change? For example, pelicans or bee eaters and whales. 
That's a really good question. And actually one of the, the bits of evidence that is included in the climate change risk assessment answers that exact question. If you look at some of the research that just looks at uh, what we call changing climate space. So um, for a particular species, they'll have a particular climate envelope, if you like, that, that is most suited to them. And you do see gains and losses. So we, we see losses in things like bryophytes and mosses, um, to various types of vascular plants. We expect to see losses across the UK in the future. For different types of insects, we actually expect to see gains. And for other species like species of birds, different groups of birds, it's a kind of mix of gains and losses. So you do see a very mixed picture when you're just looking at that climate envelope modeling, if you like. And we, we've seen you know, new species coming into the UK, particularly from, from Southern Europe, particularly migratory birds, those sorts of things. We're seeing increases in things like great white egrets, for example. Um, and we're pretty sure that that's partly due to warming temperatures. But what we don't really understand and what the modeling doesn't show us is when you layer over human pressures on different habitats and species, you know, nature is already in drastic decline in the UK and across the globe. We're one of the most nature depleted countries on the planet in the UK. And when you, when you layer over that those pressures as well that picture may change completely and this is what we mean when we say we have to reduce other pressures on nature in order to be able to see those gains happening as well as try and protect um, nature against those losses okay Catherine thanks very much we look forward to coming back to you as we get into the discussion and Q&A a little bit later on but thank you very much for now so we now go to our second guest tonight who's John Rowe who's Senior Land Management Officer with Staffordshire Wildlife Trust John has worked for the Wildlife Trust in delivering conservation and land management for 15 years since graduating from Bangor University with a BSc in zoology and conservation and he previously worked at North Wales Wildlife Trust but as I said he's now at uh, Staffordshire Wildlife Trust where he is responsible for a team that manages the restoration of uh, northern nature reserves within the Peak District National Park including the iconic Roaches estate. In total his team manages just over 1800 acres of Staffordshire's uplands. John, thanks so much for joining us tonight. And it's uh, very good to see you again after I met you up on the roaches on a visit, uh, I think about a year or so ago. Um, John, when I came and, and visited, you told me the story about the horrendous fire that happened on the roaches a, a few years ago. And I remember it starting, the story starting with it, you on your day off and you were fitting a kitchen. That's correct. Uh, yeah. Can yeah. you pick, pick the story up from there? Thanks. From there, so yeah, so uh, I was on annual leave, and uh, a phone call came through to well, an answer phone message. I picked up an answer phone message from a neighbouring landowner on my phone, um, reporting smoke from a woodland, and uh, I then immediately got in contact with our assistant ranger, who went up and had a look for the smoke. Uh, couldn't find it. Um, later on, about one o'clock, because um, I was checking it throughout the day, I could see I can see the roaches from my home. I'm very fortunate. Um, and uh, I was checking and I could see smoke um, and uh, the, the fire had um, had escalated. So, um, so there was what had happened was um, wild campers had put a fire out and that's what the original plume of smoke was uh, that was seen by the landowner. And then that had just cigaretted away during the day uh, and then spread out. Um, and then at its maximum, it spread across 60 hectares by the time it had finished burning. Um, it was uh, it was on fire for over multiple days. Um, it was a huge. Um, it was a huge fire. Uh, it was 60 hectares in total. Um, it started in the woodland uh, on the front of the roaches, which is a difficult area to access. Um, and it's the first time I've ever seen flames licking up trees um, in this country. Um, like uh, it was like a California forest fire. It was um, very surreal to be around. Um, and then it spread up over the crag. Um, the trees were exploding on the on the crag line where the trees breach the, the top of the crag. They were all exploding, like um, throwing green vegetation onto a bonfire. And then at its fastest, it was spreading. At, uh, it was a speed of uh, five meters uh, a minute uh, across the across the moorland. Um, so it was um, an extremely intense fire. A few neighbors had to be evacuated from their properties. Um, and uh, the wind direction changed multiple times. Uh, we utilized helicopters, um, multiple contractors, uh, low ground pressure vehicles. Yeah, it was a, it was a big uh, enterprise to try and get it under control. Uh, the fire service were fantastic throughout. 
what was what preceded this? I mean, uh, you know, as I remember you telling me before, it was it was obviously at the after a very long dry spell. But just how dry was it up there when this started? So this this was the driest summer since 1976. So it was we were seeing bilberry turning orange and dying. Um, we were seeing uh, in some of the drier wet areas, we were seeing sphagnum mosses turning brown and therefore becoming combustible. Um, we were seeing um, Doxy's Pool, which is an upland tarn uh, on the top of the roaches. That was considerably the driest I've ever seen it. Um, it was a muddy puddle at best. Um, so it was it was extremely unusually dry um, up there. It was um, yeah not not the norm for this British summer. So tell tell me a bit more about what you've been doing since to to try and restore the roaches. It's quite an extensive effort you're putting in, isn't it? Yeah. So it's sixty hectares. We had uh, we we'd currently started restoration on that area. It was an area of the roaches called Roaches Saddle. So it was an area of blanket bog sits below the main crag on the back of the roaches um, and we'd already started doing ditch blocking uh, we've done some peat buns in there as well which are basically speed bumps for water uh, normally utilized on lowland uh, raised bogs but uh, we'd, we'd installed them in a in an upland setting and they were very effective and they held water since the dry, through the drier summer and they recovered the quickest um, but as well as uh, so we've installed uh, more peat dams we've installed um hundreds of stone dams, um, each consisting of two to three tonnes of stone. Um, and these filter the water, slow the water down, uh, the sediment settles behind them. Um, and this basically is preventing the peat being lost from the hill altogether. So the peat's washing away and moving around, um, but it's, um, it's being trapped in these ditches. And the other thing we've done is we've planted over 100,000 sphagnum moss plug plants as well uh, as part of the restoration process. Um, and we are looking at doing more restoration going forward as well on a larger scale on the on the roach on the fire site, but also across the site um, because of the effects that we saw on, on, through some of the measures that we put in before the fire. And how quickly, you know, what are you seeing there as the kind of response to that? You're, how quickly do you sense that, you know, that restoration is proving successful or, or how long will it take for you to know, really? Well, we've. Um, we're already seeing the um, sediment traps, the, the stone dams working very, very well. We're seeing re-establishment of cotton grass, um, common cotton grass behind these stone dams. So um, those seeds are being washed in and, and we're seeing re-establishment of cotton grass, which is fantastic. The sphagnum moss plugs are doing uh, fantastically. They're about the size of a tempe um, when, when we plant them. And most of them are sort of uh, the footprint of a mug or um, a side plate or something along those lines. So they've done really well. And a lot of these, the tussock forming sphagnum mosses, which are so important for storing carbon in the future and getting these blanket bogs um, working again and, and, and uh, functioning as an ecosystem. Fantastic. Well, let's hope they get to the size of a dinner plate, uh, a, a dinner table sooner rather than later. Let's <laughs> say that. Um, John, we've had a question come in in advance from Graham Gill. He says, upland peat bogs exist because they're cold and wet. Can they survive climate change? I think ultimately, yes, they can, but we've got a lot of work to do. We need to restore these habitats into functioning ecosystems. We need to be uh, restoring the hydrology so that they retain water. We need to be repairing the damage. Um, we need to, and that in itself will help climate change because damaged peatlands contribute to 5% of the UK's annual CO2 output. So you know, damaged peatlands are contributing to, to climate change, so repairing them will help the blanket bogs of the future as well. Um, but the main thing is re-wetting, establishing uh, blanket bog vegetation. And a lot of these habitats have lost huge amounts of species through mismanagement. So reintroducing those species, and those species that I'm talking about are vegetation, um, so plant species that have been lost as well. Although if a lot of this is about holding water back into the landscape, we might think of another species that could do that very well for us as well. But, you know, I've just got <laughs> perhaps a bit of an obsession. John, thank you very much uh, for that. That's been fantastic. I said that when I first met you, I met you uh, up on the roaches and that was fantastic to do so. But for everyone else tonight, we've got the next best thing of taking you to the roaches directly to meet John there. We've got a video of John on the roaches.
Oh, that's already gone. Okay, sorry, that one's that one's already gone. All right, so um, uh, we move on next to Rosie Holdsworth, who's uh, joining us as Countryside Countryside and Partnerships Manager from the National Trust. Rosie, thank you so much for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. A great you could join us. So Rosie looks after the National Trust's countryside places in West Yorkshire, including overseeing exciting conservation projects, working with partners as well as having responsibility for the conservation and restoration of three beautiful countryside properties, ranging from formal gardens to windswept moorlands, hidden uh, woodland valleys. So, Rosie, what impacts have you noticed in Yorkshire and what action are the National Trust taking with respect to climate change? Um, so I would say, I suppose, uh, the... The impacts that we've noticed, I suppose, are a kind of a microcosm of um, the broader impacts that we, we will feel across the whole of the UK. Um, so our properties in West Yorkshire are um, mostly based in the South Pennines. They're really beautiful. We've got a large moorland property um, right through, as you mentioned, to formal gardens. And the impacts that we're seeing are really um, around much, much drier, hotter summers um, and much more mild, wetter winters. So we found um, the, the impact very similar to, to John there at the Roaches um, of the drier, drier, hotter summers um, and really early hot, dry springs are massively increased fire risk. Um, so we've had a number, unfortunately, of, of really dreadful uh, pollen fires in, in recent years. Um, it's it's Seeming, seemingly becoming a sort of yearly occurrences that will you know we could we could fairly confidently predict unfortunately that we'll get um get a mall on fire pretty much every spring and um, so we had big significant fire in 2019 on Marsden Mall um, and again last year in 2021 so the the um early hot very very dry spring um is is certainly a change that we're really feeling at our places um, and then not not just on the moorland um, and with the fire risk but in our woodlands as well and um, so those those very hot very dry springs are really stressing the trees when they're at quite a vulnerable stage and um, when they get buds and the leaves on and that's contributing to to stress in those trees which um other issues so pathogens tree diseases then can um, can take hold and can unfortunately um, claim some of our our lovely woodland um, and then in terms of the, the other end of the year, I suppose, um, in, in the winter, um, so very long, very wet and quite mild winters, um, which, again, um, in the South Pennines, we have huge issues with flooding. Um, so one of our properties, Harkerton Crags, is very, very close to Hebden Bridge, which had really catastrophic catastrophic flooding um, in 2015. And again, unfortunately, in 2020, um, just before a global pandemic. Um, so the, the flooding not only impacts um, our properties in terms of sort of damage, um, you know, landslips, um, erosion to, to riverbanks, um, you know, flooding of some of our, uh, some of our infrastructure paths, tracks, um, flooding, you know, visitor centres, that kind of thing. Um, but I suppose more importantly, it's, um, it's affecting our local communities. So where lots of our staff live in um, um, where we work um, so having really devastating effects on on local communities um, so yeah the, the sort of two extremes I would say really um, in terms of extreme sort of heat and, and drought and quite un, unseasonably dry hot weather um, and then through the winter um, just very very long very wet winters um, which which cause problems and again for, for tree disease as well and um, so stress to stress to trees um, so yeah those two extremes of, of temperature and um, moisture, I guess, are what are the, the big issues for us in the South Pennines. Um, in terms of what we're doing about it, um, so all the stuff that John mentioned, um, the work that's been undertaken on the roaches is very much reflected on Marsden Moor. So we've been working for decades on Marsden. Um, I, we think, we think uh, in this, this winter season just gone, we planted our millionth sphagnum plug um, so we've we've done plenty of plenty of sphagnum inoculation. I think our volunteers are, are sick to the back teeth of it. Um, but uh, yeah, other stuff. Um, so the gully blocking work, um, building dams, that sort of stuff. Exactly as John mentioned um, on the mall in there. Um, and then in our woodland. So we know that our woodland's got a really important role to play, um, particularly where we're located at Harcastle Crag, very very close to the centre of Hebden Bridge. Um, so we identified that we could really have a 
positive impact on downstream flood risk. Um, so we've undertaken, um, a, it's been about five year long now, um, natural flood management project. So working with uh, natural processes in the woodland um, as part of our woodland management work, uh, creating leaky dams and, and really importantly for us working with community partners. So there's a really passionate, um, engaged community just downstream of us who are desperate to um, do something to, to sort of tackle their own flood risk. Um, so utilising our, you know, two assets there. So the, the keen local community and our wonderful woodland um, and, and using that to, to reduce flood risk downstream. Um, and then what I mentioned earlier on about um, the, the sort of importance of, of our woodlands and, and our woodland management, um, you know, I think there's a lot of focus um, as on, on sort of woodland creation as a, as a solution to, to climate change and um, as a way of sort of um, locking down and, and harnessing um, carbon from the, from the atmosphere. But woodland management has a really important role to play as well. So making sure that we're looking after the existing woodlands that we've got um, and making them more resilient to, to future change. Um, so that's a really key, a really key driver for us. And then the other one is obviously tackling tackling fire risk um, and engaging local communities. We've seen a huge increase um, in countryside users and a different sort of people coming out to our countryside for maybe for the first time through lockdown, which is absolutely fantastic and really what we want to see more of. So it's about having conversations with people that are coming that are coming to our places about climate change. You know, I think like like you mentioned at the start, we've got this sort of disconnect. When people think about climate change, they maybe think about sort of sub-Saharan Africa and they don't think about you know Master Moor or Hardcastle Crags you know it's happening now our places are really being impacted by climate change now um, so making that connection with people and explaining to them that, that some of the issues that they're seeing um, here in real life are as a direct consequence to our to our changing climate. Great Rosie thank you very much very very interesting to hear that um I'm going to put one question to you that we've uh, had in tonight um, because, of course, the National Trust is well known for its uh, wonderful Blossom Watch. And you were talking quite a lot about uh, trees there. But there's a very specific question from Hilary Ash, appropriately named Hilary Ash. Um, it says, spring blossom seems to be flowering well before many insects are out this year and last. Are we seeing the talked about disconnect between flowering times and insect activity? And what can we do about it, if anything? Yeah, that's a really, really interesting question. So um, I, I certainly think, um, you know, there's there's lots of sort of anecdotal evidence um, that that disconnect and the, as I mentioned, the sort of fairly chaotic um, springs that we're seeing where, you know, one week it seems to be high summer and the next week we're back into uh, wonderful winter wonderlands um, is having an impact, I think, on our, on our wildlife, um, on things like trees flowering, coming into leaf, um, coming into bud um, and on the emergence of insects and therefore on um, other species so um, nesting birds for example um, I think that pinning down that anecdotal evidence and, and really building a solid scientific ev evidence base and a, and a kind of um, backing that up with with really robust science is, is going to be absolutely key um, so we know um, you know it's, it's not enough to have a hunch that, that something's happening we need to be able to back that up so um, there's lots of opportunity for, um, for citizen science to really play a role here um, and yeah hopefully um, other others other members of the panel on this call can um, will know more about it than I do but um, yeah there's certainly opportunities there for um, some really robust sort of scientific um, investigation into is what we think is happening actually happening on the ground Great, Rosie, thank you very much. Really good to kick us off there and, and hear about the great work you're doing at the National Trust on this important issue. And we can see a bit more of Rosie in action. We do have a video, I'm assured, of Rosie in action. So let's have a look at that now. I'm Rosie Holdsworth and I'm the National Trust Project Manager for the Growing Resilience Project. So the Growing Resilience Project is a £2.6 million project looking at natural flood management and woodland creation opportunities in the South Pennines. 
So it's really important that we look after landscapes like this, not only because they're beautiful places that people love to come and visit, uh, lots of different types of wildlife call these places home, but also they're a really important part of our fight against climate change. So they can help us uh, to store water in flood events. They can help mitigate the effect effects of drought, particularly in terms of soaking up and storing carbon in the earth here. So under the Growing Resilience project, we've done a huge amount of new woodland creation. We've planted over 110,000 trees at a site near Todmorden. We've also done uh, more than 800 leaky dams. So all sorts of different types of leaky dams and those are natural flood management interventions, holding water on the land and stopping it from flooding downstream properties. And we've also done a massive amount of moorland and heathland restoration. So restoring peat bogs and getting moorland back to an active state where it's soaking up carbon, soaking up water and protecting downstream communities. So our partners on the Growing Resilience project are Yorkshire Water, they're obviously a huge landowner in the region. Um, we've also worked really, really closely with the Woodland Trust who've led on the woodland creation element of the project uh, and the White Rose Forest who've assisted in terms of funding that element of the project. We've also worked with Moors for the Future on some really ambitious rhododendron clearance here in the Westendon Valley um, and we've worked with some uh, local community groups such as Tree Responsibility in terms of the project delivery. The Grow Resilience project was funded by West Yorkshire Combined Authority, so this is kind of a new direction for them in terms of funding nature-based solutions to climate change problems. So I feel really proud of the project. Um, we've had a huge impact just in a very short space of time, really. Um, we've been able to deliver it on time and to budget, which is always really nice as a project manager. But really the key for me is the, the ongoing changes that we'll see as a result of that project. So the reduction in downstream flooding, uh, the storage of carbon and all those trees becoming a, a beautiful established woodland. Well, thank you, Rosie and the National Trust for that great video. And I was talking before about John Rowe's video up on the roaches in Staffordshire. Unfortunately, we weren't able to show it to you, but uh, my colleagues are going to be posting it in the YouTube chat for you to watch later. Not until Wildlife is over, of course. You can't watch it until Wildlife is over, but um, do make sure you watch it at the end because it's a great video about the work also being done on the roaches. So now to our fourth panelist tonight, uh, the one and only Professor Sir John Lawton, who I'm delighted to be able to join us tonight. Uh, Sir John is one of the UK's most distinguished ecological scientists with a long history of working at the science and policy interface. He chaired the panel that published the groundbreaking report, Making Space for Nature in 2010. Can you believe that was in 2010? Uh, 12 years ago, which is still the cornerstone of conservation policy and practice in the UK. He has worked on the impacts of climate change on ecological communities for over 30 years. And John is president of the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust after previously serving as their chair of trustees. So John, so pleased you could join us tonight. Thank you very much. And I'm going to kick us off by just asking you, in that report you did, uh, making Space for Nature back in 2010, uh, you produced what's now been known as the Lawton Principles, uh, <laughs> named after you, Lawton Principles for Nature Conservation and Nature Recovery. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about that? What are those principles and, and what were the main messages in that report from 12 years ago, which is still so true today? As if anybody, <clears throat> excuse me, if anybody told me that 12 years after we produced it, it would have been an even bigger impact than it had when we first produced it, I wouldn't have believed you. It's, it's quite humbling, actually. Um, they, we, we were looking for something that was a simple summary that uh, a minister or a, 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 a politician, in, a policymaker could understand. And actually, it was on the panel was Tom Chu. Uh, and we were struggling to think of a really succinct thing to say. And, and it was Tom who came up with the, the four expressions, more what we need are more, bigger, better and joined up wildlife sites. We need more of them. Uh, we need bigger sites. We need uh, better managed sites. So we need to join them up. And that more, bigger, better and joined mantra is now trotted out all over the place. But actually, people have probably forgotten where it came from. But that is actually based 
practically what we need to do for nature conservation in the UK in the absence of climate change. And we've already heard from my fellow panelists, you know, it isn't just climate change that's causing problems. In fact, the, the effects of climate change are made worse uh, by, by what we're doing to the broader environment. But it's also what we need to do to help species adapt to and cope with climate change. Right. OK, so what does that mean in practice? More bigger, better, joined up, you know, what, what in, in reality, how, how do you get that? I mean, maybe tell us a bit more about things like nature recovery networks. And how would you roll this out? Well, what we 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 what we, uh, we we said in making space for nature, which is still true, is that we you know clearly the existing nature reserve network protected area network was not doing an adequate job heaven knows what it would have been like if we didn't have it so that's not a criticism of the network it just isn't enough um, and that the uh, more bigger better enjoined is we need we, we if we're going to reverse while the decline of wildlife in the uk and indeed across europe we need more protected sites to start with that's pretty obvious uh, we, uh, we we need bigger sites because actually in terms of habitat management the bigger your nature reserve the bigger your protected area the lower your management cost per unit area uh, so that if you've got a choice, make your reserves bigger. Don't add lots of little reserves. Uh, the third the, 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 is that most of the countryside of, 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 of the UK, virtually all of it, is actually uh, a, a human-dominated landscape. That we, we live in a cultural landscape. So if you don't, we, so we need to manage our nature reserves, most of them, by by instituting grazing practices, other ways that we manage them flooding and so on that mimics natural processes but actually they're often too small for that to happen on their own the bigger you can make your reserves the more you can put uh, let nature ecosystem processes take over themselves uh, but we still need to manage uh, more bigger better managed sites it isn't until you really get to something like 10 or 12 square kilometers which we're now heading towards for several of our reserves or for rewilding where you actually really are managing management cost per unit area become right down uh, because nature begins to take over the ecosystem processes and then more important most important of all we need to join them up uh, there are many many if you're a bird it's pretty straightforward you can usually fly a few hundred kilometers to find the next best place but for many many species and many many uh, birds plants uh, uh, plants insects uh, other small creatures even crossing a two kilometer wide gap in the countryside of an urban area or in towns arable land means you can't make it to the next bit of suitable habitat. So we need to join up our reserves with a protected area network that consists of either stepping stones between reserves or corridors between reserves. Uh, and, and, and there are, you know, and there are many, many uh, features of the countryside which are already corridors, hedgerows, railway bankings, motorway bankings, canal sides, uh, that not just specially created habitat sites uh, that, that, that will serve as corridors and species will move through them to, 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 uh, to establish or re-establish populations in new areas. So these conclusions that you came to 12 years ago uh, would have been appropriate uh, even if climate change didn't exist as a problem, uh, would have been appropriate just for putting nature in recovery, given uh, what a poor state, sadly, our nature is in in this country. But with climate change, and particularly with the sort of the, the science, the, the further stark science that's emerged on climate change over the last 12 years, perhaps one of the reasons that it has held so true in that report is is still talked about so much is because it, the, the conclusions are even more relevant now because of what we know about just how severe climate change is. How do those principles apply specifically for climate adaptation, would you say? Well, interestingly enough, of course, Making Space for Nature explicitly said that you need to do this for climate change. Mm. Uh, but it, it, at that time, you're quite right, Craig, people weren't necessarily thinking like that. Well, think about it. Um, we, we know that uh, from hundreds and hundreds of scientific papers now, literally hundreds, that species are, are, are having to move their geographic ranges to stay within the climate envelope that Catherine talked about. And they can't do that unless they can move through the landscape. Uh, and there's no way we're going to be able to uh, move species physically ourselves, the great majority. They're going to have to move. So corridors allowing species to move to find the right 
climate envelopes are absolutely fundamental and if a species can't move uh, then they will they will go extinct in, in in the in the island that they're locked in on um, that also, if we better manage our habitats, then we, uh, the population abundances of the species in those protected areas will increase. And that will give us more propagules. So those species will send out more messengers, if you like, to find new places to live. And healthy populations have more dispersing individuals uh, to, to recolonize areas and so on. Uh, and, 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 and the whole business of communities of species of plants and animals adapting to climate change is made so much more resilient if they have healthy populations, large populations in a joined up landscape. Great. Thank you very much. Well, thanks so much for setting us off on that. And we will pick up uh, more in the Q&A and panel discussion shortly. Before we go to that, though, we also want to hear a word from uh, the Wildlife Trust President Emeritus, Sir David Attenborough. A wildlife-rich natural world is vital for our well-being and survival. We need wild places to thrive. Yet many of our systems and laws have failed the natural world. We now live in one of the most nature-depleted places on the planet. Nature urgently needs our help to recover. And it can be done. By joining up wild places and creating more across the UK, we would improve our lives and help nature to flourish. Because everything works better when it's connected. Now is the time to tell our politicians that we need a nature recovery network set in law. A legally binding network for nature would mean that wildlife is prioritised when managing our land and planning our towns. Powerful new environmental laws can ensure habitats are expanded and reconnected, meaning all life will thrive once more. It's time to turn things around. Nature is capable of extraordinary recovery, but we must act now. Tell your politicians, now is the time to put nature into recovery. Everything works better when it's connected. There we are. We thought you'd want to hear from Sir David tonight as well. OK, we know that in these wild lines, uh, you love it when we give you a poll or two. So we're going to just offer a poll now in the YouTube chat. The question tonight is, have you noticed any new species arrive in your local area uh, as a as a result that perhaps might be explained by climate change. Have you noticed any new species arrive in your local area? So uh, do that's going in the chat now or very shortly and do make sure you respond to that. So we've had lots of comments coming in from you. Thank you very much. Uh, we've had uh, Chris Fry saying to you, John Rose saying, well done, John, for putting in those buns, the first on Upland Pete, but far from the last. Uh, David Hodgkins says, I'm not convinced water companies are exemplar of good practice at the moment. Uh, Alistair Driver has said, if anyone on this call is responding to the Nature Recovery Green Paper consultation, please push for a much greater contribution from the Environment Agency flood budget for natural flood management, currently less than 1% of their budget. And uh, East Dorset Friends of the Earth has said, I think one way we can engage the public is to emphasise the importance of our natural environment on the heath on the health and well-being to us all. So keep those comments and questions coming in, please. And I'll kick us off with uh, one of the first uh, questions that we've had here tonight was uh, from Chris Redding. It says, does the speed of environmental change mean that species adaptation will not likely be fast enough to avoid mass extinction of specialist species? Who wants to kick us off on that one? So John, oh, well, think about it. Um... It, 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 evolution happens on a generational time scale. So if you're a hoverfly, that's every year. Uh, if you're an oak tree, it's every hundred years at the most, at, at the very least. Uh, and so small bodied species are able to evolve. And there is quite a lot of evidence now that evolution is happening in response to climate change, but they tend to be small bodied species. Big 
species like oak trees or long-lived mammals, they're going to, if they evolve at all, they're going to respond much, much more slowly. Uh, so we're going to get a massive resorting uh, of the flora, fauna and flora that are able to evolve a response uh, from those that are simply not going to be able to do it fast enough. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's not a lot we can do about that. Of course, species are responding by moving and population distributions are moving rapidly all over the globe, polewards in the uh, north in the northern hemisphere, south in the southern hemisphere, and altitudinally up uh, all over the world. And we can see that actually happening in real time as we speak. Um, but uh, the evolutionary responses are, will depend on really how many generations there are in a year or a century. Uh, and the bigger, the bigger you are and the slower your generation time, the more difficult it will be for you to evolve. Yeah, Catherine, you've been doing a lot of thinking about what we need to do at the wildlife trusts on, on this agenda. I mean, what are we doing? Uh, and, uh, it, you know, so far, and what more do we need to do, along with many other nature organisations, of course? Yeah, we're actually preparing our first ever uh, cross wildlife trust adaptation report at the minute, which is going to be published over the summer. And as part of that, we're trying to, to grab together really all of the actions that we are taking that class is adaptation and as Sir John said actually pretty much everything we do is adaptation in one way or another because most of the conservation we work the work we do and the work that John and Rosie have spoken about as well is about the Lawton principles creating more nature reserves joining them up making them better quality and reducing other pressures on them um, and one of the other things that, that Sir John's early work showed as well is species coming into the UK, not, not so much invasive species, but we would call them, I suppose, beneficial species or neutral species that we're seeing come up from southern Europe. Generally, they tend to arrive first in those high quality habitats. And that's a really key point that, to help facilitate species moving northwards and, and to higher elevations. You know, these, these habitat networks are so important to allow them to disperse. But some of the more tangible things, I mean, we've talked a lot about wildfire already um, in the discussion. And, and actually, that's a really good thing, because I would say wildfire has been a really overlooked risk from climate change for the last five, 10 years or so. Certainly in, in the last um, climate change risk assessment, the one that we that was published last year that we were talking about earlier, you know, we, we really tried to highlight the risks from wildfire much, much more. But we've also talked about the risks from flooding, from drought and from extreme heat. Um, you hinted at beavers earlier, Craig. So beavers are a fantastic ecosystem engineer. And one of the reasons they count, if you like, as an adaptation option is because they're fantastic at holding water back in catchment. So they are actually uh, a type of natural flood management. Um, and one of the things we'd like to see actually is coming back to the, the point made about the Environment Agency's budget on, on natural flood management. You know, we'd love to see a third of that budget being spent on natural flood management. And we know that the EA's done mapping for England and we're trying to, to improve that for the rest of the UK as well to see which areas would, would benefit most from natural flood management. But the other side of nature as an adaptation is actually what it can do for people. So we know that having urban green spaces really important for reducing extreme heat risk to people's health. Um, we, we already have around 2000 heat related deaths across the UK every year. You know, it's a really high number that, that obviously isn't that well publicized. Uh, and we saw in, in the COVID year um, in 2020 during lockdown that, that we had uh, a record number of heat related deaths in the summer. And that started to be linked to people being in, in houses that are overheating. And we know that urban planting trees, urban blue spaces can do a lot to reduce urban heat risk and also urban flood risk. So surface water flooding, which is from um, flash, flash flooding from storms quite often during the summer. Again, having green spaces in urban areas can do a lot to soak up that flood water. Uh, and that's a really important measure for, for our cities as well. So there's all kinds of things we can be doing on adaptation. But the, the trick actually is trying to, to get it all down and to monitor what we're doing because there's so much happening. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, Rose, let me ask you, uh, Penny Coggle has uh, put a question and said uh, in response to when you're talking about the plant uh, tree planting, she said, if there were very dry springs and summers, how, how would you ensure that those planted trees survive uh, in that? I mean, how do you go about that? Yeah, so we have to be quite careful about um, the tree species that we select. Um, so making sure that we are uh, selecting species that are 
um, potentially more resilient to to future changes to the climate. So thinking, you know, um, about the lifetime of the tree. So as Sir John mentioned, um, you know, those uh, something like an oak tree has a uh, every hundred hundred years that's their generation. Um, so th thinking about that whole lifetime of the tree and what that site that they're going into is likely to look like in 50, 100, 200 years time. Um, you know, thinking about um, the soils. So the health of the soils is really, really key. Um, so even before we've considered put, um, putting trees into a site, what, what are the soils like? Um, how healthy are the soils is the, the work that can be done beforehand? Is tree planting the most appropriate um, course of action for that for that site? It might be that, um, you know, there are, there are species already there that um, are, are quietly locking away carbon. Um, and by digging it up and planting trees, we may actually be doing more harm than good. Um, so, yeah, so thinking very carefully about um, kind of the right tree in the right place. Um, the, the, so the selection um, of the right, the right tree species and, and the full sort of life, lifetime of that tree and that whole woodland. You know, you're not, you're not planting trees with a, um, as sort of individuals. It, it, you're creating a new habitat. So how will that, how will that habitat react to to um, future pressures, future uh, surrounding land use changes, changes in hydrology um, and changes in the overall climate. Um, how will that habitat respond to that? And therefore, is woodland the most appropriate, um, the most appropriate land use? Um, yes, yeah, so lots and lots of thought has to go into it. Um, and we have to be quite, quite careful. And to a certain extent, um, you know, the, there's, um, there's all sorts of science and, and modeling that we can do. Um, and, you know, we've got we've got fantastic experts that can really help hold our hands um, and point us in the right direction. But sometimes you never really know until you just give it give it a try. Um, and you might be lucky. You might have a, a cooler, more uh, more traditionally British spring and your trees get away fantastically. And, and look at you or you might be um, challenged. So um, the site that we showed in the video there, Gorpley, um, in West Yorkshire near Tobberdon, we were we had a really challenging um, planting season. So very very cold, harsh, wet winter, um, a very early, very hot spring, and then a sudden, real hard frost. Um, so a lot of the trees that we planted, um, unfortunately, they just got the buds on, and then we had a really harsh frost, and they were they were knocked back. But actually, uh, you know, we thought, oh, what a disaster. Um, but they they are you know they are designed. <laughs> For, for our fickle British climate and, and you'd be surprised of the resilience of some of these poor little saplings up there on a windswept hillside. Um, so yeah, sometimes um, all the all the evidence and the science and the expert guidance is brilliant, but just having a little bit of a go and seeing what seeing what survives um, sometimes is the is the way to do it. Absolutely. Great. Well, we had an excellent question in from Chris Fry, which I just have to ask. Uh, and anyone that knows me will why I want to ask this. Uh, Chris Fry has asked, I think it's to you, John, um, how can we make sphagnum moss as cute and cuddly and attractive as beavers? Now, I, I've i got to ask that because I think sphagnum moss is very cute and cuddly, to be perfectly honest, and I love beavers as well. <laughs> so, But maybe, maybe John, you could answer it by telling us just why is sphagnum moss, moss so fantastic? Why is it so important and so special? Well, it's, I mean, sphagnum moss, it's, it's just a fantastic thing, isn't it? I mean, it, it holds up to 18 times its own weight in water. It's, it creates, almost creates its own habitat once it, once it gets going, you know, it starts holding water and then it benefits other species and plant species around it. So, you know, it's as it, a much smaller scale than the beaver, but it's, it's doing the job once it gets established. Um, the peat buns we talked about earlier, they were put in as speed bumps for water to slow the flow of water down. Spagnum moss does that. It's, it's, you know, what we're replicating. It, in, it adds that surface roughness to the moorlands. It holds water back. Um, slows the flow, um, releases that water slowly. And it's, it, you know, it's fantastic for climate change as well. It stores carbon, these tussock forming sphagnum mosses. Um, and if you've ever been up onto a blanket bog and you can see, it's, it's not quite like a horror movie, but you see these sphagnum mosses kind of taking over and absorbing these heather plants. It's, it's just a fantastic thing to see uh, a plant, you know, a species doing what it's supposed to be doing. And they come in numerous ranges of greens and reds. So they're quite beautiful as well. 
for them to grow, you have to get the bog nice and wet is the point, isn't it? That's why you need to put those dams in those that you're saying, hold the water back, fill in the old ditches that have been put in before to drain the uplands and, and reverse that really, get, get it wet, keep it wet and so on. And obviously that's a very challenging context of, of climate change. But but again, when we when I visited the roaches and you were taking me around, one question I had to ask, and I've got to ask you again, because I love the answer. You, you might not be able to remember the answer you gave me, but, but what about beavers? You know, we normally think of beavers as quite sort of lowland species, but actually, you know, should they just be lowland species? Or can you imagine in the uplands? I can see Sir so John wanted to answer that as well. But John, John, why don't you give it a go first? And then well. It, it, it depends on the it depends on the river systems that, that are available to them. It depends on on the, on the water uh, quality available available to them. Um, on our fast flowing uh, on the River Dane, it wouldn't and it's quite gullied. It wouldn't necessarily be appropriate habitat for them. Um, but you know uh, there will be uh, river systems in elevation where where it will be appropriate for them to go. Um, where there's floodplain for them to for, for, for the um, for water to be held back into so um but maybe not on the river dane but um other rivers in the upland systems may be appropriate yeah i mean the, the, if just above pickering on the on the scarp slope of the north york moors uh there had been there was a beaver reintroduction program there now it's not on the high moorland but it is very definitely upland and they're doing brilliantly and was, while I've got the floor, the, the, just talking about very, very early on, Craig, you were talking about people criticising water companies for some of the things they do. And I, I, I don't I agree completely with that. But you also need to remember that some water companies are absolutely vitally important in terms of upland peatland restoration. United Utilities, uh, York, Yorkshire Water, uh, Southwest Water are all doing playing a major role in restoring wetlands uh, on their catchments. Uh, particularly in the uplands, but also southwest water. Why? Because it's a heck of a lot cheaper for them to restore the blanket bog and to restore the the southwest the the, the coon grasslands than it is to build a water treatment works. Uh, and so it's a win-win situation. Uh, and, 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 uh, and those water companies working with the Yorkshire Peat Partnership, for example, are doing some amazing things. We've restored 370 square kilometres of the Upland Pennines uh, in partnership with uh, United Utilities and, and, and Yorkshire Water. Uh, because the, And it's a win-win. The, the, we, we get the habitat and they get clean water. Fascinating. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, we asked you the poll earlier. We asked you, have you noticed any new species arriving mm. in your local area? And 17% uh, of you said you're not sure. 32% of you said no, but 51% said yes. You 51% of you have noticed new species arrive in your local area. So the next question we want to poll you about is, have you lost or noticed any species decline in your local area? Uh, that might be explained by climate change. So have you lost or noticed any species decline in your local area that might be explained by climate change? That poll will be going on in the YouTube chat now. And we'd love to hear what you think about that. So I'm going to rev the panel up a bit more now by throwing what is definitely a controversial question into the mix. It comes from Jack Bedford. Do we need to consider introducing non-native species to its retain ecosystem resilience and function in habitats where key species are threatened by climate change? So, John, do you want to kick that off first? Yeah, I think that's a really, really interesting question. And the problem, one of the problems is that whatever the science suggests you might do, there are massive you know, legal constraints on, on where you, you put species. Somehow it has to be part of their native range, which, of course, is itself a nonsense. If you go back 10,000 years, there were woolly mammoths wandering around. To the, uh, and I, I'd love to bring woolly mammoths back to Yorkshire, but it will, if we could get any, they would be illegal. Um, uh, you know, I, I think we probably are going to have to do some serious thoughts about that uh, and there are the, you know the, the 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 present species assemblies that we regard as somehow natural are very in terms of evolutionary time incredibly recent uh, they didn't exist 10,000 years ago at the end of the ice age uh, and if you go to places like the Stillies, if you go to, 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 to the Silly Isles, you get these wonderful uh, dune systems and, and, and hedgerows and hedge banks. Virtually none of the species there are native, none of them. And yet they're wonderfully 
flower rich species rich ecosystems uh, and it isn't going to be easy but i think we're really going to have to seriously think about engineering habitats by bringing in species that are surrogates for species that we lost we already do that we no longer have our ox but we have longhorn cattle and we have uh, you know, other animals that fill the same role conic ponies and so on we already do it to a degree uh, and uh, and the, the the purists who want natural ecosystems, what do you mean by natural? How long have they been there? And what was it? What was the landscape like ten thousand years ago or hundred thousand years ago? What do you define as natural? And there's no such thing. Okay, good. Thank you, Sir John. Um, who wants to have a? Who else wants to go have a go at this one? Can I just can I just quickly dive in? Yes, yeah, so I think um, what Sir John was saying there is is kind of absolutely bob on the mark. Um, and it, you know, I, it feels like. Um, often the, the science says one thing and, and the legislation as it is currently um, sort of ties our hands a little bit and, and restricts us to um, quite a narrow, uh, you know, a narrow band of activity that we can do within that. So it's, I suppose it's a question of, around sort of where do we draw the line in the sand? Where, like, what, what does a healthy, uh, you know, in my case, I'm talking about um, South Pennine Moorlands. What what should a healthy South Pennine Moorland look like in the 2020s, 2030s, 2000s? You know, um, how do we define who gets to say what what should be there? You know, what species should be present? Um, are we by by trying to sort of by fixating on um, our idea? You know, somebody's idea of um, a, a healthy, thriving blanket bog habitat and the species that the species that are there. Actually, in some cases, we don't know whether our moorlands ever were in that in that state. You know, that there would have been areas of dry heath. There would have been, um, you know, potentially areas of uh, of um, sort of scrubby montane woodland um, interspersed with blanket bog. So it's very much, you know, um, an arbitrary sort of red line on the map that somebody's decided that's what that habitat should look like Absolutely. and actually often we're sort of chasing our tail in a way trying to get our our habitats back to that sort of healthy thriving ecosystem that we think should be there but perhaps never was there in the in the past and and in the face of climate change is really unrealistic to be there in the future so with that in mind um if we want to see healthy biodiverse habitats is there a place for for new species for sort of novel species whatever you want to call them um, and who gets to who gets to decide that really who gets to decide what those ecosystems should look like and and does that decision reflect the reality in the face of our um, unfortunately our our broken climate Rosie, can I, when you're planting trees are you allowed to bring in genotypes from further south in europe uh, not not usually, no. Oh, no not, us not usually, you see, that's the problem. Whereas you yeah. could future-proof the trees you're planting by bringing in genotypes of the same species, but from further south. Absolutely. But but that, but you, but that but then there are plant health regulations and there are other yeah. things that makes it difficult. So you know the the kind of really sensible creative solutions we want are actually hamstrung uh, by by thinking that we use the world as static and it's not static. Very interesting, Catherine. Yeah, just I just want to pick up on because actually this is part of a more fundamental question as well about what even is adaptation in the natural environment. When we say could nature adapt to climate change, we would probably say, well, no, not not staying in its current form, given the pressures and the changes that we're seeing. So given we can't keep things as way they are, which is the kind of historic approach to, to nature conservation, what is it we're trying to achieve in adaptation and in nature conservation more widely as well? And it becomes very difficult because nobody has answered that question yet. And it's such a, a almost a basic question to, to, to start with, really. And as, as Rosie's just said, you know, who gets to decide what, what our future landscape is going to look like? I mean, I'm quite a fan of, of thinking about things in terms of ecosystem processes. So, you know, as, as Sir John and Rosie have said, if, if we have well-functioning ecosystems, which, which have species groups that represent different parts of that ecosystem, and it's performing services to people and it's functioning well, then that's probably what, what we should be aiming for given the changing climate. And we need to start thinking in more transformational terms about this, given what's coming, you know, the, the risks that, that I talked about right at the beginning. We're not 
tinkering around the edges anymore. This is a really, really systemic change that we're about to see happen globally and in the UK. Um, but there needs to be a conversation in government and, and, and a public conversation as well, probably, about what does that look like? What is that future that we want to see? And once we know what that is, it becomes much easier then to talk about the work that we're doing um, in terms of achieving that. But, but this idea of, of, do we want to try and conserve landscapes because of their cultural value as well as their, you know, their biological and their, their social value to people, that, that's a really difficult conversation to have. And it requires, you know, a lot of different people around the table to, to have that as well. And maybe local nature recovery strategies, those sorts of mechanisms, which we see coming through um, with, with recent legislation might be a good way of doing that. But, but we have to see that embedded in, in the policy shifts that we're getting at the minute. John Lowe, as someone that's doing the work on the ground here and, and managing the sort of teams that actually do that work on the ground, what's your sense as to, to how far we go on this? I mean, non-native species or, or bringing in different phenotypes, does that feel right to you or does that feel uncomfortable? Well, <laughs> change, adapting to change is always a difficult process for us as human beings, isn't it? You know, whether it be a change in industry or a change, you know, as we're talking about. So... I, I think these these things, decisions have to be made and somewhere we have to take a punt on these things and we, then we have to do the science. You can't you can't guess at these things. Um, yeah, you can model to a certain degree, but somewhere somebody has to take a punt on these things so that we can then see uh, what the advantages or disadvantages of these things are. Um, you know, we're, we're at a stage now where we need to take, yeah, it's, they're, not, they're not risks, but we need to take advantage of this situation and we need to do these things to see what is going to be best practice for the future. Um, you know, look at the advantages of using proxies um, for, for grazing, uh, as grazing animals. That's, that's had huge, um, we, we've, we've uh, adapted that and we've, we've moved hugely on, on, on that into, across the country. Um, you've got rewilding projects across the country using um, these proxies uh, and we've seen huge biodiversity gains after after you know changing the grazing systems on the sites um, and without people taking those risks and doing those things we wouldn't have seen those biodiversity increases so um, I think we need to take a punt on some of these things. Great thank you very much well we've had some great comments coming in we've had um um Sue Doxat has said leave space for wildlife in our own gardens dig up the Dig up the soil and let the green, dig up the grey, sorry, and let the green grow. Quite right. Uh, Bob Earl putting that point. Water companies are major partners in upland recovery. Jake Fines has said, uh, but Jake Fines, uh, that would be a hokum estate, has said both talking about, I think this is about sphagnum and beavers, both are wet and hairy. What's not to like? Um, Timothy Biddle has said on a recent edition of Country File, a presenter was espousing the value of reforestation and carbon sequestration and the increase in biodiversity. The saplings shown were all conifers. I think we can all touch at that, can't we? Um, Mary <laughs> May Dyer has said, make Sphagnum Moss as theatrical as the Netflix show Fantastic Fungi. I haven't seen that. I must admit, I must, must see that sometime. Art touches the heart and the imagination of people much more than dry lectures. Absolutely. Good. So I'm going to ask you a next question. This is coming from Abby Bunker, who I know is uh, at the Woodland Trust and greatly joining us tonight, Abby. Um, Abby's asked an important question, I think, and I, with this panel, we definitely need to ask this question. It has been some years since the making, and I'm, I'm going to warn you now, I'm going to come to Sir John last on this one. Uh, <laughs> It's been some years since the Making Space for Nature report was published and the Lawton Principles became part of conservation approach in the UK. Do the panels think its key findings and recommendations still stand? We've kind of answered that and said yes, but said given the shifts in political and public debate and the external context, how might we make them more relevant and pressing for current administrations and the public? And I suppose the broader question there, the question I've really got to ask Sir John tonight, but I said I'll come to him last, is if he was doing a report again today, is there anything he would add, anything he would do different? If you did, a, if you did, a, could press a refresh on it now, what more would you emphasise? What would you do differently? But as I said, I'll come to you last. <laughs> uh, Catherine, I'll come to you first. Oh, thank you. I thought you'd like that one. <laughs> Catherine, if, if, um, yeah, what would you add to Sir John's marvellous report from 12 years ago? You know, given everything that's happened in the last 12 years, how to, uh, if it was being published afresh today, what would you add to it, maybe? 
just, I have spoken to John about this before, but in the, in given where we are with climate change in particular, and as he said, you know, this was a report about adapting to climate change. It, it wasn't, and it, and it works for conservation across the board, but there was a very clear focus on, on adaptation throughout the report. I, I like the idea of having a discussion about Lawton Plus, and maybe Sir John would like to write another one um, now and, and, and have a go at that for us. But some of the things we've been talking about, like what are we doing about species wildlife translocation in the UK? You know, it's not something that, as we've discussed, we've, we've really seen yet, apart from efforts to reintroduce um, lost native species like, like beavers, you know, that we've already been discussing. Is that something that we should be considering? is needed. And maybe there's other things around that as well about diversification of habitat types. That's another one that we, that we could think about in terms of how do we spread our risk um, or how do, we, how do we help nature to spread risk across different locations? So should we be thinking about uh, more mosaic habitats and, and what that looks like? And, and is there a way of doing that spatially? So in, in local areas, you know, we, we try and think about the best measures. John was talking about what is the, what is the best thing to do in, in, in each location? Um, those are some of the themes that, that are within the report, but maybe are, are almost like add-ons that we could think about for a new type of adaptation strategy. Absolutely. Uh, Rosie, what about you? What would you do to, for uh, what would you suggest for Lawton Plus? <laughs> Just been frantically scribbling. Um, so, yes, I think um, Catherine, Catherine kind of uh, got at it there, um, but you know, perhaps sort of tackling some of those potentially thornier issues so things like new species um you know um as I, as I spoke about earlier on that sort of having a kind of frank um frank discussion I guess around uh, the reality that a lot of our, our habitats face um I think a key a key one um sort of additional to the more better bigger etc cetera, etc cetera, um is is around recognizing the importance of engaging whatever you want to call them the great british public the general public with with the importance of um the state of nature in the uk and um really recognizing that as a as a real key issue and a potential key opportunity um so that that engagement and i suspect i suppose everyone who's um who's watching this at home is probably you know you're already engaged um engage with message and engage with nature but um that that broader engagement i suppose um and and really making um making the lot and principles and making the the work behind that um and conservation and nature in the uk really part of everybody's day-to-day -day life and sort of explaining its its relevance to to everyone and why we particularly given our climate emergency and, and you know mental health emergency um why it's important now um, going forward so that that I think yeah recognizing the importance of engaging the general public with these messages rather than those of us who are already here we're already listening we're already on board and in the room um you know we're not gonna we're not gonna affect the, the scale of change that we need without bringing everybody else along with us so people who don't feel that nature and wildlife is relevant to them or part of their lives well, that's absolutely perfect sort of segue into John from Staffordshire Wildlife Trust. John, you have to do this day after day is talk to stakeholders on the ground about exactly this and, and you know, explain the big, better, more joined up but to, to people on the ground and why that's important. What do you feel is needed to make it easy to get that message across? Absolutely. I, I, th I think it needs embedding into uh, into education systems, into it just needs embedding in every layer of everyday life. Um, uh, so that so that you know these principles and nature uh, and the benefits of nature from everything that Rosie's just talked about, and I'm, I thank Rosie for bringing that up because it's um, it's one of the things I wanted to say. Um, so just embedding it uh, into everyday life um, is so important. You know, I think the pandemic emphasised that the numbers of people coming out into the countryside, um, this fantastic new audience that we we've got to engage with. Um, it you know it's just opened up so many more conversations for us on the ground um and you feel that people going away uh, are more in uh, more in the know about things so i think it's, it's so important that we just um keep on with that message and fantastic organizations such as ourselves 
getting that message out there. Um, but schooling, uh, education has is, is got to be up there uh, as well um, with these messages, this messaging. Absolutely. Absolutely. So, Sir John, you looked absolutely thrilled when I suggested the idea of a update, 2022 update to your seminal report from 2010. Well, what, what would you do? I think you're on mute at the moment, Sir John, by the way. Um, what what would you do if you were doing it again today? What would you add to it? What what might Lawton Plus look like if you? Well, could? if I pick up some threads from me, I mean, over twenty years ago, I, I wrote a, a a small piece called "The Science and Non Science of Conservation Biology," and I pointed out that actually science can't tell you what it is you want to conserve. That's a societal question, and and I don't think making space for nature actually really address that at all. Who's going to decide what it is? We're going. To, how do we decide? Uh, and and I don't know what the answer to that is. And I haven't thought about that very hard, apart from the fact that I know that science doesn't tell you what it is that you ought to be conserving. There are all kinds of uh, arguments, the rarest species, the most genetic diverse species, you know, I mean, who, who decides? I don't know. So I think I would want to do that. Um, I think we did not. We, we, we did discuss rewilding. You remember 12 years ago, rewilding, most people had never even heard of it. And we talked about rewilding. Uh, and I don't think we did adequate, uh, we, we paid adequate attention to that. One of the things we did conclude is that it isn't a panacea that, uh, you know, the, the, where, the areas where you can rewild are by and large going to be remote from where most people are. And we explicitly said that people shouldn't have to travel 100 miles to see something more interesting than a skylark and than, than a gray squirrel and a dandelion. Um, uh, and, 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 and that actually we need to, th I mean, rewilding clearly has a place, but actually Actually, we need to have we need to really emphasize contact for nature for people in their everyday lives. And we said something about that, but I regret we didn't say as much as we should have said. And what we didn't do, Craig, which actually because I deliberately said we mustn't uh, to the panel is we didn't actually set any specific targets. We want which we now have 30 by 30. We, we said uh, that we, we have a direction of travel. We need to turn the direction of travel around, but we didn't specify how much we had to do. And actually the substance of the conversation uh, I've, I've been having with DEFRA recently is just, you know, will 30 by 30 actually deliver? There are people in, 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 in parts of government wanting, what, what evidence is that 30 by 30 will actually do the trick? Will it be sufficient? Now, I think that's analysis paralysis if you're not careful, uh, but, you know, because you can overanalyze the bloody thing uh, 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 for, to perfection but what we need to do is just get on with it and turn uh, and move in that direction and i think we should have emphasized that um uh, and, and uh, the the, uh, the the other thing that i th we now talk about 30 by 30 there's an, an interesting really fundamental difference between the way we deal with a green network green infrastructure and concrete infrastructure G government local and, and, and national reserves the right to compulsorily purchase land for major concrete infrastructure. We did it for HS2, we do it for motorways, we do it for railways, all the things that we build. Why do we not do that for green infrastructure? What is stopping us from compulsory? If we had to, we do it voluntarily, that would be better. But if we have to, if we really want to create an effective nature network, what's wrong with compulsory purchase for key sites? We do it for concrete infrastructure. Why can't we do it for green infrastructure? And I think I would like to give a lot more thought to that. Very interesting. Very interesting. Just say a little bit more, Sir John, why, why you said you were very sure and told the panel not to set targets in uh, 2010. That's because, an interesting comment. Because we we didn't have the science. I don't think we could we could actually say for, for certain uh, a number like 30 by 30. I mean, 30 by, by 30 is a wonderfully uh, simple concept to get across. But I just felt at, the, at that time, we really didn't have the evidence that it would work. But on the other hand, if you think, just think about the NEP estate, the rewilding at the NEP estate. It's 25 kilometers from Gatwick Airport. It's 14 square kilometers. Nobody analyzed why it should be there or what we were doing. Charlie and Izzy just set it aside and created a wonderful rewilding area. And nature has just flooded back. So it, to interpret what you're saying, it's not that you're necessarily against targets per se, but you no. need them to distract from, from everything else you were saying. And, thank you. Yeah, that, yes. that's, yeah. You know, I just don't want, I don't want analysis paralysis. Yeah. 
Got it. Okay. Thank you very much. Very, very interesting. Well, uh, fascinating conversation here. And we've had sort of some fascinating things coming through from you tonight as well on the polls. We asked you, have you lost or noticed any species decline in your local area that might be explained by climate change? 29% of you said not sure. 11% of you said no. But 60% of you said yes, you have noticed. Uh, you have lost or noticed species decline in your local area that might be explained by climate change. There you go, quite extraordinary, isn't it? And we've had, as I said, some um, brilliant comments coming through, far too many to read, I'm afraid, but Terry Lockwood has said, I'm encouraging our school to allow more areas to rewild. Our current project is a wild pond. We get quite a few frogs in the grounds. I want children to learn the importance of nature and climate. The Eco Schools project is great and we're trying uh, for our green flag. Our school eco council are working up hard. More schools need to sign up. Helena said that she thinks the lockdown has made the general public realise green and nature spaces are so important. I completely agree on that, Helena. There's lots of evidence that's the case. At the Wildlife Trust, we saw a huge increase in people visiting our reserves in the first few months of lockdown. And I think actually, to, to Sir John's point, I think local nature has ended up being particularly important through uh, COVID. People have come to realise and appreciate the importance of low nature on their doorstep, not just far and distant. And Kristen Matthew has said, I'm from a village in uh, Kerala in India. It is really disappointing that we are witnessing heavy floods in the last few years. Many have died and we've also lost lots of habitat. True evidence of climate change. Well, we're into the last few minutes uh, for tonight, I'm afraid. Uh, we've had so many sort of good conversations and so many uh, excellent questions coming through. Um, uh, but I, but I, what I want to really sum it down to is what do you think has to happen urgently in the next three to five years, would you say? I mean, <laughs> we're just talking about problems of targets. But what would you, if you if you could get um, Boris, if you could get Boris with a cake tonight uh, and a few beers and uh, outside of lockdown walls and uh, sit him down and say, this is the most urgent thing that needs to happen in the next three years, what would you go for? Sir John. Sorry, you're, you're mute, Sir John. Sir John, you're uh, we should, mute. We should, we should, we should hold the government to their promise to create, to, re, to restore and recreate a, a series of very large protected areas. They've said they would do it. There is a lot of rowing back in government now. Uh, and I, I would just say, you said you were going to do this, do it. Okay. And what about and if you don't, you can't have a cake. <laughs> Absolutely. And that cake's got to be produced from somewhere. We've had a had a comment from Jake Fines tonight, not surprisingly. The panel has not mentioned farming yet. And this is 70% of the landscape. Sorry, Jake. We we should have done that. It's my fault, really. Um uh so Sir John, what would you just say on a little bit on farming and adaptation and climate and nature? Oh gosh. That's a really big issue. Uh, I mean, I think a, a, a the the big debate is 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 food security and the belief that we have to really really grow all our own food. Well, at the moment we grow sixty percent of our own basically our food. We import the rest. Uh, farming. I, I I work with a number of wonderful farmers in the North Pennines and in the Dale of York who are doing the right thing for nature because they have marginal bits on their land that are not producing anything very worthwhile. Uh, and and actually by by not trying to farm those, they're reducing their overheads and increasing increasing their margins. Uh, so they're making space for nature on their farm by producing less food, but making a bigger profit uh, uh, and, and doing the right things just they want to do. Uh, and I think you know, we need to work with those farmers and landowners who are doing some fantastic things, putting nature back into their farms and still work making profitable farms. And they need praising and working with much more than we're currently doing. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Rosie, if you could get boys round a cake, what would you say to him about what needs to happen in the next three years on this agenda? Oh, blimey. I think I'd, um, it'd take longer than a single piece of cake for me to, uh, to get my many points across to Boris. Um, but yeah, if I could if just, just pick one, I think, um, yeah, if, if uh, Boris and his government are um, prepared to sort of cut the red tape and get out, get the, get rid of this silly nonsense and legislation around not building skyscrapers on newt ponds because newts are getting in the way you know if you can cut cut red tape and make things much more streamlined and easy for 
uh, for, you know, for the development and new infrastructure, then surely we can um, cut some of the red tape and, and streamline things to, to enable sort of ambitious landscape restoration, nature restoration, joined up big scale projects to happen. Um, surely, surely, if we can get things like H HS2 off the ground, um, as Sir John mentioned earlier on, we can certainly find space, uh, space for nature as well. Thank you very much, Rosie. John from Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, if you could sit down with Boris and a slice of cake, what would you, in the cabinet room, what would you, what would you say to him? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think Rosie hits it on a real important point there is, is cutting the red tape to streamline the process um, of, of habitat restoration um, and just make more funds available um, for um, habitat restoration um, and building resilience into habitats uh, across the UK, whether that be the uplands, the lowlands, um, and uh, so that we can get more of this connectivity uh, and more resilient habitats and ecosystems functioning. Uh, I think that's what needs to happen. Great, thank you. And Catherine, what about you? Uh, like Rosie, um, I have a lot of things I would say, but I suppose if, it, if I had just one, it would be to make nature Think of nature as the current government thinks of big, shiny infrastructure. You know, we are losing nature on a massive, massive scale in this country and something drastic needs to change soon. So all of these policies and, and nice words that the government has come up with over the five years, they need to get on and do it and time is running out. So in the next three years, for goodness sake, try and move towards 30 by 30 and actually bring nature back as, as government has promised to do. So let's rebuild our natural infrastructure fast and focus on how quickly we can build that green natural infrastructure. Absolutely. Good. Thank you very much. Um, just before we close, I'm going to mention that, of course, there are uh, updates to national adaptation policies across the UK in 2023 and 2024. And we all need to be asking governments to take adaptation of the natural environment more seriously. So make sure you're following Wildlife Trust uh, uh, social media and subscribe to our email newsletters to see how best to do that. And we'll let you know when we uh, hit the time. Keep an eye also on our social media feeds and website for more information in the next couple of weeks about Wildlife for May, which is going to be an episode features on rivers and river quality uh, with a very special guest. And fingers crossed it should be on location and I won't be sitting in my attic I'll be actually out on location what could go wrong but we're very excited about that for wildlife for May and if you want to be sure you're not going to miss it do hit subscribe on uh, our button for the YouTube channel for Wildlife Trust YouTube channel and you'll receive automatic updates I want to finish by saying a huge thank you to our brilliant panel tonight Professor Sir John Lawton British ecologist and conservationist Catherine Brown, our very own Director of Climate Change and Evidence at the Wildlife Trust, John Rose, Senior Land Management Officer at Staffordshire Wildlife Trust, and Rosie Holdsworth, Countryside and Partnership Manager at the National Trust. So John, Catherine, John and Rosie, you've all been brilliant. Thank you so much. It's been a fantastic discussion. As ever, also thanks to you, the audience, for turning up and putting all those hundreds and hundreds of questions and comments as the, you've been listening live tonight. And please do share. This is, this is available for you to watch pretty much just a, in a few minutes after we've finished tonight. And please do share it on social media so that many other people can watch it as well. We have thousands, sometimes tens of thousands of views for these wildlife after they've been aired. So please do share it as widely as you can after it's been aired. And we're going to play out tonight, though, just try and pull this all together to show you a video that the Wildlife Trust put together for COP26. Because at the end of the day, we all need nature. Thank you and good night. We all need nature, yet we've exploited our natural world and the climate to breaking point. While places are disappearing, half of UK wildlife is under threat. Temperatures are rising and extreme weather events are on the increase. And as the nature and climate emergencies worsen, the threat to life on Earth escalates. But it doesn't have to be this way. We have the chance for a better and wilder future. We can create a world where people and wildlife thrive alongside each other. We must stop the burning of fossil fuels and reduce our greenhouse gas emissions. 
And we must also let nature help tackle climate change and adapt to its impact by restoring and connecting up woods, salt marsh and peatland. Nature can store carbon, provide clean air and water, protect us from flooding and extreme weather, and provide the food we need to survive. The wildlife trusts have been working hard for decades to help nature recover, bringing back wildlife once lost from our sea and land. But we need you. We need to be bold. We need to take decisive action. And we need to work together. Every action, big or small, makes a difference in the battle against nature loss and climate change. It's not too late to solve this. Let's act now for a wilder future. <laughs>